gentlemen. What the world has been waiting for, what the world needs now, the one, the only, amazing, original, Johnny Blades. Often imitated, but never duplicated. There's Johnny. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all to the original Johnny Blaze show. It's always great to be here as I blaze right in with my karate kick. Let's have a blazing hot fun time. The last date I went on did not go well. I promised this lady a seven course dinner, but it turned out to be a six pack and a burrito. At least I was able to get her back in time before she charged me for the second hour. Women marry because they believe they can change their husband. Men marry because they believe that their wife will always stay the same. Now, both of them are in for a nasty surprise. Well, the next time you and your wife get into an argument, simply talk to her in a calm, soothing voice. That's sure to really make her angry at you. Some women keep their husband's name after they get divorced, not because they're feminists, but so no one they went to high school with can ever track them down again. There were so many times when my ex would tell me that I brightened up her life. What she really meant was, I kept leaving the bathroom light on. A bride and groom decided to write their own wedding vows. When the big day came, the bride was the first to speak. I wish for love, happiness, and a long life together. After a long pause, the groom began to speak. Just don't touch my posters and comic books. Keep the fridge full of beer and leave the AC on during the game. Every man wants a beautiful wife, a sexy wife, and a cooperative wife. Unfortunately, bigamy is still against the law. We have a blazing hot fun show with a special guest. He is a multi-talented entertainment publicist, writer, speaker, and podcast host. Please give a big warm welcome and say hello to the one and only Bruce Wozniak. Hello, oh, Bruce. Hi, Johnny. Hey, Bruce. Welcome to my show, the Amazing Rich Johnny Blaze Show. Thank you. Hey, you're looking sharp. You're looking uh, smiling in a great <laughs> spirit. Yeah, it's good to see you there, Bruce. Likewise, likewise. Thank you. Okay, you just, you just super job of promoting this, that's for sure. Uh, anyway, you. anyway, Bruce, you know, everybody in life, they have their own special, unique, and exciting story. Uh, yeah, talk to me. Tell me about how you got started in entertainment, uh, where you're from, all about now here, this, you know, this, this spectacular entertainment uh, company that you've uh, developed and created. Well, the history of now here this goes way back to a previous career a previous job uh, a lot of people like to say a previous life <laughs> that i was in i had actually moved into the tampa bay area and was working in a job where we were going to need somebody to perform the national anthem for an event and so the story goes that there was a young lady singing in church whose voice i really liked and so one week I approached her afterwards and asked her, do you ever sing outside of church? And she said, yeah, from time to time. And so I told her about this event. Would you be interested in singing the national anthem? And the more that we kind of started to get to know each other, the more I said, you know, I'd really like to help you just kind of get yourself out there more because you're so talented and you've got a really terrific voice and people should know more about you and hear you more. And it was one of those cases, Johnny, where, you know, Initially, it's kind of like this pullback, like, oh, my gosh, who is this guy? Why are you, you know, approaching me like this? And I was trying to make it really clear that, look, I'm just volunteering. Like, I'm not charging you money. I'm not doing this, you know, to make a buck. I just really believe in your talent. And so she told me that uh, her dad helped her out with everything. And, you know, thank you anyways. And it ended up that, you know, the dad was uh, a realtor, right? So he didn't know anything about the entertainment business. He didn't know anything about promoting. And mm -hmm. here was me that my entire background was in public relations, in media relations and promotion. I had worked in the National Hockey League for 10 years. Uh, I had worked in another sports job as the vice president of public relations at the league office. So I had all this background behind me in PR. 
And I just wanted to help promote her. So I think the dad, you know, the wheels kind of started turning. And I think he thought, you know, look, I don't know anything about this. And this is a guy that does, and he's not going to charge us for it. So, you know, I think the dad kind of said, well, why don't we let him help us out? And, you know, unbeknownst to me, I think it was kind of one of those prove it to us things. And I started getting more results for her and more results for her and more results for her. And all of a sudden I looked myself in the mirror and I said, gee, I'm getting all these results for her. I think I'm onto something here. I think I can make a business out of this. And so then that's when I decided I wanted to launch the company Now Hear This. Well, that's quite an interesting story there, Bruce. Thanks for sharing that with me and sure. our audience. Oh, really? That's really something because you it sounds like you're doing it from your heart. You love what you're doing. And uh, that gave you the experience and the confidence, I guess, to get started on this. Right. And, you know, it's interesting that you picked up on that in so far as my motto has always been that I will only take on people who I truly believe in uh, because it doesn't come across as genuine when you don't believe in the person. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people in my business who do what I do that give what I do a bad name because they're only in it for the paycheck. And I looked at it the other way. I thought I'm going to take quality over quantity because my name is on the business and I didn't want to get to a point where I was just taking people on just for the sake of making money, regardless of how talented they were or were not, because what would happen would be I would put somebody into some kind of opportunity. And then the next time I had someone else and I called upon that place and said, hey, I have somebody for you. I could just kind of picture them saying, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce oh, oh, this is the guy that, oh, the last person. Uh, no, thanks for calling, Bruce. But yeah, we're good. Appreciate you checking in, you know, and little do you know that it's because the last person you sent him really wasn't that great, but you just did it because you wanted the paycheck, uh, which, like I said, in my heart is not the way to go. It's for everybody to decide for themselves what their approach is. But for me, like I said, my reputation is at stake here. So I don't want to represent anybody and everybody just for the sake of always having lots of clients. I really salute you on that, uh, Bruce. That's great because Thank you. sure, sure. I'm, I'm publicist. I know they can make, they can make a great living, uh, but you're not just doing it for the money. You know, you're doing it from your heart, your mind, body, heart, and soul, and you're putting everything into it. And you're very sincere and down to earth and people pick up those kind of vibes. It's called karma. What goes around comes around. You're sending out very positive karma messages, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And people, people like that. You're attract. Yeah, that's how you attract people. You know, you don't repel them, get them to run away. You you attract them to go towards you and and to work with you and want to do business and uh, and make money with you and and develop the talents that the people have. Well, yeah, you're right. And I think you know because at the beginning of now hear this and mind you, the company has been going for more than 15 years now. But back when I first founded it. I kind of, and maybe it was because of that first client, but I kind of carved out this niche where I did start off working with, when I say young people, I'm talking, you know, maybe uh, the end of high school, you know, maybe they were a senior in high school, that kind of age. And so you're leading by example, like you were saying, and you want to show them that part of the entertainment business, and really it goes to any industry, but you don't want to be going and me, 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 look at me and just talk about yourself and have your hand out. And what can you do for me? You know, there's that fine line that you have to walk because you do have to get opportunities. But at the same time, I recognize that, okay, they're looking to me for some guidance. They're looking to me for leadership. They're looking for me to set an example. So what kind of an example would it be to them if I was out there trying to be greedy and grab up everybody and everything I could and then turn around and tell them the opposite? So well, I think that really kind of helped me and it kind of helped my clients and it really set the pattern for the road that now here this would go down. And I developed eventually, and to this day, I still refer to this, I call my four P's approach that I take to my business, which is patient, polite, professional, but persistent. I love that. Is that something you wrote or you made up or just something that you, know, you followed from somebody else? It's something that I created on my own. And I think it's just kind of something that I took a step back and observed about myself and kind of decided that this is a way that I am kind of just my personality, but I thought it also reflected nicely in my business in that you do have to be patient, polite, and professional in this business, but at the same time, you do need to be persistent. In other words, you can't be so nice that you're patient, polite, and professional. You ask somebody one time and you say, 
well, they haven't gotten back to me yet, but that's okay. They're probably busy and they'll get back to me. No, you need to be persistent and you need to follow up and you need to ask more than once because maybe they didn't see it or maybe the answer is no and they're just not telling you. Or maybe it's a case of, you know, a lot of people will do these email blasts and so somebody could receive something that you're submitting and they just think they're part of an email blast. And little do they know that, no, I'm really writing to you and asking you about this opportunity. So if you come back around and you're persistent, that fourth P in my four Ps, then they're going to say, oh, okay, well, this person is genuinely interested and really is interested in contacting me and what I have available for them. So now I'm going to write back. Well, that's how I felt, you know, and I'm dealing with you. Um, you, um, you have, because of you, I have had uh, three clients of yours that you uh, referred to me. And I really appreciate that. You know, as, as we said, of course, there was Kristen Schalk, and then there was uh, Dalton Burdett, and then there was uh, uh, T- Tanya Todd. Yeah. And without you referring me to them, of course, I'm sure I, I would not have had them on as guests on my show. So once again, I enjoyed it, and I appreciate it, and I just want to let you know. And well, then, thank you, and, and I appreciate it, of course. Right. Well, it's, it's called What Goes Around Comes Around Again. It's called Positive Karma. Yeah. You're sending out positive karma, and I'm sending it right back. Yes, and, sir. Uh, I never take anything for granted. I appreciate when people are kind and considerate like yourself. So Likewise. That's fantastic. That really is. Uh, so what's a, what's a, uh, a typical day as, a, as an entertainment publicist? Okay, first of all, you've been doing it for how many years? What year was it you started uh, now or this? Was it? Uh, the ago? company was actually incorporated in the state of Florida in 2004. So oh. 17 years now. That's a long time. Okay. And uh, what's a typical day on, on the job as an entertainment publicist? Exactly what, it, mm-hmm. what do you do? I like to say that there is no typical day. At the same time, I do kind of follow a little bit of a routine insofar as, you know, one day I might be working on this one and only client and a little bit on my business. Uh, this day I might be working on one or two clients and my podcast. Uh, This day, I might be working on three of my clients, but, you know, a large part of what my day-to-day is, I have always said that I feel that now hear this really kind of, as much as I do the work that we've been talking about, I really feel like it's kind of built on a foundation of communications. So public relations, media relations, marketing, the web, social media. So it could be anything from contacting someone like you and trying to book a client into more interview opportunities. It could be following up on an interview that somebody did to say, okay, did we get the recording of it? Did we get the pictures from a performance in the case of uh, a a performer client? Um, You know, chasing down kind of those details that number one, frees up the client to do what they specialize in. You know, and that's a large part of what I feel I bring to the table is we all have our individual talents. And so shouldn't the entertainer be spending all their time on what their skill is, as opposed to chasing down all these little details that a publicist will do for them. And then likewise, for me, I should be following up on those things and saying, well, if I'm going to promote this person further, if I'm going to promote this person better, in other words, then I need to have all of these assets available For instance, if I'm pitching someone for an interview, that person who is the host might say, well, what else have they done? What what else have they been interviewed on? And so I need to make sure that we have that collection of interviews listed somewhere. I need to make sure that I have things like photos of the guests because a lot of hosts will say, yes, send me a photo or two that we can use in promotion of it. So there's so many different things that you need to have available to promote your client as a publicist. And then, like I said, a lot of it is really kind of being on the hunt for new opportunities. Of course, you know, a lot of clients will have kind of say some milestone dates in mind. Uh, When you had Dalton Burdett on, he was promoting his short film. So, you know, that was very time specific because it's okay. We know that as of such and such a date, this film is now going to be available on Apple TV, on Google Play. So a lot of it is kind of, you know, backing out a calendar and working up to that so that everything falls nicely so that whenever that magic date is, whether it's, you know, a client that has a new song coming out or a new EP or a new album, or in Dalton's case, uh, the short film being released on different platforms, a lot of your day-to-day is, 
keeping those targets in mind. I even keep a social media calendar so that every day I know what I'm going to be posting on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on all these different platforms. And it's based on, I could book someone on the amazing original Johnny Blaze show and you can tell me, okay, Bruce, I will interview you client on this date. And right away it goes on the social media calendar. That way it does two things. For you, Johnny Blaze, it ensures you that now here this is going to promote the client being on there. It's also kind of a reminder for me, let's make sure the client is all set. They have everything they need for this interview. But it also kind of allows you to say, okay, I know what I'm putting on social media this day because there's so much pressure to constantly be creating content. And a lot of people get nervous because they look at social media and they say, I don't have anything to post. So when you create a social media calendar, you're days and weeks ahead of time so that you do know what's going to come. And, and I really have noticed over the years that that's kind of one of my areas of specialty is uh, I'm smiling and laughing because I'm about to say creating something out of nothing. And it makes me think of a Seinfeld episode, you know, oh. with the pilot and, you know, what'd you do today? Nothing. That's a show. Because in my case, I've had clients who I'll say, okay, we need a new article on the homepage of your website. We haven't put anything up in a little while. And the client will say, well, I don't really have anything going on. And I say, yes, you do. And they say, well, what do I have going on? And I say, let me write it up for you. I'll email it over and you can look at it. Uh, and so then that's kind of, you know, manufacturing news so that you always look like you're busy. Uh, I have someone that I do some work for. He was just on a call with me yesterday saying, I need two press releases written. So let's kind of get those in the pipeline. And it's just always manufacturing. And when I say manufacturing, I don't necessarily mean creating something out of nothing. I just mean kind of creating that awareness that, you know, I think what happens to a lot of us is we are so caught up in the day to day that you don't realize that that is news to other people. To us, it's just kind of something that we're used to doing. And to other people, they find it interesting. And so you need to just create an awareness of those things for people so that they can learn more. And again, for me as a publicist, the more I'm doing that for my clients, the more people say, ooh, tell me more. You know, this is interesting. This person looks like they're busy. They look like they're always doing something. So all of a sudden there's a new opportunity that may come up for that client. You're creative and you're coming up with uh, ways of uh, uh, promoting these people when they think that there isn't anything. That's I, I like that. I really yeah. do. That's a, that's a winner. It really is. It's very positive. Yeah. Very, very good, Bruce. Yeah. So I know there's, sure there's quite a bit. I mean, you go outside when you I mean, I guess you work a certain time, amount of time, I guess, in the office. And what about the, any venues outside that you, you work any uh, particular places when you do your promotions? Well, you know, I do find that I spend a lot of time uh, back and forth between Nashville and Los Angeles, um, between having a couple of clients in Los Angeles. Um, you know, Tanya, who you had on the show, she's in Las Vegas, um, right. Nashville. I've just gotten to know so, so many people there. And events will bring me to some of these cities also. Sometimes I'm speaking at events. Sometimes I'm just attending. But, you know, what has happened is when you're at it as long as I've been, you start to build up a tremendous network of contacts. And I really am a strong believer in being present in so far as actually being face to face with people. I really do try to work hard at staying in touch with people in some way, shape or form, whether that's a text message, a phone call a video conference, you know, Zoom or Skype, uh, whether it's an email, some kind of staying on people's radar. But at the same time, I really like to, the old expression, press the flesh, you know, and be there in person with people uh, just to network and just to maintain those relationships. So whether it's Nashville or Los Angeles or whether it's someplace that something takes me to, uh, for instance, last month, I had gotten invited to a songwriters festival that was in Alabama. And that's because it was someone that I knew that said, I know that you take an interest in these kind of events. I know this is kind of, you know, in your wheelhouse. And there ended up being at least one other person there that I know, maybe another, but along the way, you know, I made a couple of new contacts. So I was supposed to be going to Las Vegas next month for the NAB show and already was credentialed, already had my flight and my hotel booked. 
and they just canceled it a few days ago, uh, oh. which is unfortunate because I was looking forward to that event. Uh, I obviously would have spent time, you know, meeting with Tanya Todd while I was there. Uh, there's another contact that I have in Las Vegas that I was making plans with. There's one other contact that I have there who I probably would have gotten in touch with as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's the way things go, not, not only in the business, but especially in this crazy COVID world that we've been living in for a year and a half. So you just have to learn to adjust. Right. I understand. I mean, I was going to, uh, my producer and I were going to film uh, outside, but it turned out because of COVID, we, we had to change that and uh, never heard about Zoom before. I heard of Skype, but never Zoom until this COVID situation came about, which is unfortunate. So many people dying, you know, from it and yeah. also people losing their jobs. And, you know, it's a terrible situation. But yeah. uh, this gave the opera. I'm very grateful. This gave the, uh, me the opportunity to to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to host a talk show. So absolutely, uh, that's very good. Oh yeah, and that was in my documentary too. Which if you want to check that out sometime, you can. Gone but not forgotten: the original Johnny Blaze story, which is which is on Amazon. Yeah, former Gong Show winner, which I am, and Elvis impersonator, which I am strived to host his own late night talk show. Uh, my co-star played Mr. Belding, the principal of Saved by the Bell, Dennis Haskins. And True Don Blue, the host of the gong show, was in there from the past. And also uh, Joey Carbone, the musical conductor. So you can check wow. that out sometime on awesome. Amazon Prime. Check it out if you like it. Uh, yeah. Nice five-star review, of course, if you appreciate it. But anyway, getting back to you, Bruce, on your um, – it sounds very interesting. You, you truly, like I say, you love what you're doing. It doesn't matter whether you're doing work, I guess, in the office or outside. It's like you're traveling all over. Um, so uh, any other um, – Anything else as a publicist that uh, I don't know about that uh, you feel is important to share it with people? I mean, it takes not just it takes a certain time of quality. Like El Elmer Wheeler used to say, "Don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle, sizzle and ship." It sounds like you're doing that. You're, yeah. you're selling the sizzle. Yeah. I think something that I found interesting is when I first founded the business, my real focus, my real interest was just in music, uh, primarily because of the young lady that I talked about earlier, and. You know, she kind of led me into, once I got the business established, she kind of led me into, and I, and I don't mean a personal introduction, I'm just saying that the way that things fell was really kind of the groundwork that put me on the path to the client that I really had tremendous success with, uh, all kinds of stuff that we did in music. But where I'm going with the story is, I was so focused on music that you know, this is someone that had come from a long background in sports doing public relations. And all of a sudden, I had an opportunity to work with someone who was an author. And I thought, well, you know, I really kind of just do music. And then that voice went in my head that said, well, wait a minute, you know, if this person's talented, they're talented as a writer, it doesn't mean that you can't work with them because they don't do music. And so it's kind of one of those things where you take a step back and you say, well, my skills are still applicable. It's just different subject matter. Instead of music, this time it's books. And so as the years have gone by and the business has evolved, I went from just working with people in the music business to having clients who are authors. And then eventually, you know, I would pick up somebody who's, you know, kind of like a small business owner and or an entrepreneur or kind of some people that are, you know, sometimes a hybrid where it's, you know, an, an entrepreneur slash small business owner. And sometimes it's, slash speaker or slash author. So the business has really expanded over the years, meaning that I decided not to just limit myself to music. And of course, as you saw with, with Tanya, who you had on, you know, she's an actress and a writer. You had Kristen Schalk on. She's a dancer first and a singer second and an aspiring songwriter. So, you know, a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years, it's kind of been a case of it doesn't have to be someone who's doing music in order for me to consider taking them on as a client. So what you're not, you're not putting all your ears in one basket. You're what you're doing is you're expanding and you're using a variety of different uh, uh, skills and, and, and talents that you're getting involved in, which is good because then you don't get stale. You're, you're doing, doing all kinds of variety and you're learning exactly. about different areas and you're networking too. You're, you know, you're doing a great job of networking with people, and that's how you're developing apparently these contacts. Uh, and yeah. it's a snowball. It's a snowball for success, Bruce, is what it is. Yeah, I think a lesson that I learned from someone that I worked for for many years, he really would always kind of enforce the point of out of sight, out of mind, meaning he would, and I'm not exaggerating, he would actually travel halfway across the world to sit in a meeting for three hours and then come all the way back. Because oh. his attitude was 
that if you're not there, they're not going to think about you and they're going to forget. And so all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, like, doesn't anybody call anymore? Doesn't anybody email anymore? And so you're right. So I have really kind of taken that to heart and said, I really need to network. I really need to meet as many people as possible. And that's why I go back to what I said a few minutes ago about pressing the flesh and going to meet people in person at a lot of places, because I followed the lesson that I learned from him and decided, well, I really need to get out there and actually see people. And I think, Johnny, that people recognize that and it goes a long way that they stop and they go, wow, you're here. Uh, and I noticed that with venues when I was getting the company going and I would book someone into a performance opportunity, I would go to their show and the person at the venue would say, wow, you're here. And they'd say, well, yeah, my client is performing. Why wouldn't I be here? And they'd say, well, most people don't do that. We don't get people showing up of the people who they just book it with us and that's it. We never see them. And so, you know, that kind of goes a long way with people where they remember you because they saw you or you did something that they're not used to in a positive way. Well, it's like the old saying uh, goes, Bruce, first, first impressions are lasting impressions. You're making an impression, not a depression, a very positive impression. Yeah, and you're, and a, you're a people person. You love people. And it shows your smile and your personality. And uh, you seem to be able to, uh, to meet all kinds of people and enjoy it. And so something, this is something I think, Bruce, that you either have or you don't have. And you definitely have it. It sounds Thank like you've got you. the chutzpah and the charisma to promote as a, as a great public relations person um, and uh, meet all kinds of people. And then um, you inspire them is what you do. You touch the minds, bodies, hearts, and souls of everybody that you, that you talk to and you meet. But it, it's, it's something that's, you either have it, like I say, you don't. And you know, obviously, I can see, you definitely have it from talking to you and from dealing with you, of course. It, it's a yeah. pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it is. Another thing that I've tried to do from time to time, and it's not always that easy because it requires a physical mailing address, but occasionally I will send a handwritten thank you card to somebody if I can find out their physical mailing address. And again, it's not that easy to do because you don't want to come right out and say, can I have your ad address? I want to send you a thank you card. Then it kind of loses its luster. But, you know, I have these cards and you see over my shoulder the, the now hear this logo. So I have these cards that have the logo on there. So someone gets it in the mail and they see now hear this. And I can just picture them saying now hear what? And they open it up and it's, you know, quote unquote blank inside. But I write in there a handwritten note that says, you know, dear so-and-so, thank you so much for insert opportunity here that you gave to my client, insert their name here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, thanks, best wishes, Bruce Wozniak. I include a business card. When you flip it over, there's the company website on the back. And that's something, Johnny, that I have noticed. People will write me emails and say, thank you for the thank you card. It's very rare that I actually get a handwritten note from somebody. And so that's another instance of where I've noticed that that's something that's effective that helps people remember who you are. When you're, stand, when you're standing out from the crowd, Bruce, is what you're doing, what people, most people do not take the time and effort to do, but you're doing it. And as a result, it really works magic is what it does. It, yeah. it, it, gives, you a, it gives people a feeling that you're very likable and you care about them. You're, you're thoughtful and considerate. And, uh, well, you don't, wor don't worry about the competition. Let the competition worry about you. That's what my, my promoter said. That's correct. But you're doing it because you love it. You really love it. Yeah. Like you say, it's not just about money. Yeah, people love to make money, of course. But it's doing something from your heart that you truly love. And it's an automatic thing. It's just something that you, you do. You don't force yourself to do it. You just do it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The song, I Gotta Be Me, I Gotta Be Me. What else can I be but what I am? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's wonderful. It really is. So, um, so you have a... Yeah, you have quite a few interesting, if you don't, you can tell me any interesting stories uh, of any clients that you've had dealt with as an entertainment uh, a publicist at all. Do you have any interesting stories to share? Well, there's a, there's a couple that uh, stem from the same client. It's the one that I mentioned a few minutes ago where I, I said the, the initial young lady kind of led me to the next one. And I said, I don't mean a personal introduction, but that next one that we went on a long run of having a lot of success together. Um, she was somebody that I, for lack of a better word, quote unquote, discovered in her high school talent show. You know, it was kind of one of those such and such has got talent or such and such idol or whatever they called it uh, at their school. And so as we started to work together, 
um, it got to a point where, you know, eventually she put out her first CD and I really had her out playing a lot of shows and doing a lot of interviews. And we decided, you know, we really just kind of wanted to keep setting the bar higher and higher. So I would book her, you know, and she was based in the Tampa Bay area, but I would book her out of the area. Uh, and one particular time I had her booked in Nashville and I had her booked to perform four nights in a row. And one of the first couple nights that we were there, I had her booked at a place where all I kept hearing is, oh, you know, sometimes some famous people come in there and this guy might show up and this guy might show up and so and so he goes in there a lot. And I just kind of decided that, you know, I, I took that I'll believe it when I see it attitude because I didn't want to get all excited and think, wow, there's there's probably going to be somebody really big name in there and then not have it come to fruition. So I was more focused on helping her out and doing our usual routine. And so sure enough, she got up on stage and as she's doing her show, all of a sudden the guy who was my contact there, he walked over and he tapped me on the shoulder and he whispered and he said, when she comes off stage, you could tell her that she just performed for John Rich and John Legend. And I said, oh, he oh. said, yeah, they, they just came in over there. And sure enough, I looked over and there was John Rich and John Legend that were watching her. And John Rich actually asked for her CD. Um, so that was exciting. And then a couple nights later was supposed to be her fourth and final night of performing four nights in a row. And we got to the venue and this was the first time this had ever happened to us. But a lot of times in the music business, you'll hear about a double booking where somehow two acts get performed, get, excuse, excuse me, two acts get booked to perform on the same night at the same time. So we showed up and this was the case. And she said to me privately, she said, that's OK. That's all right. We can just go back. Let them let the other one do it. I don't need to perform. I said, no, no, no. We didn't come all the way to Nashville to pass up an opportunity. She said, you know, I'm tired. It's been a long week. She said, we can just go back to where we're staying. I'll do some songwriting and it's all right. You know, I, I'm not upset. And I said, well, I understand. I said, but we need to see this through. We need to get you on stage. And, and for once, Johnny, there was a little bit of tension, you know, I, I could feel, I could feel that pushback and it got to a point where I was talking with the person that I booked it with, as well as somebody from the venue, and we're kind of standing in this little huddle. And unbeknownst to my client, I'm saying, you know, she'll go on later if that's what it takes. So they said, well, let us see what we can work out and, you know, just stick around here. We'll see. Uh, we don't know how this happened. We're really sorry. And so I went over and I said, you know, they're working it out. We're just going to hang out. We're going to see what they come up with. And she said, why don't we just leave? I said, just stick with me, you know, hang in there. And so sure enough, they called me over and they said, okay, if she can wait until 930, we can put her on at 930. I said, she'll do it. And so I went over and told her and she said, you told him that and you didn't even ask me. And I said, you're going to do it. And she said, you know, we've been here so long and look at what time is now. Look at how much longer I'm going to have to wait before I go on. And I said, you got to do it because, you know, we're in Nashville and you just can't pass up opportunities. Oh. So she kind of one of those and went off to the ladies room. And then when she came back from the ladies room, she looked at me and she said, I'm going to do it. And I said, you are. And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, I'm proud of you. Thanks. That's awesome. So she did the show. Oh. And as she's finishing up, she's coming off stage and I'm over here packing up her merchandise and, you know, kind of the promotional stuff that we had out flyers and things like that, her banner, getting my camera and she's over packing up her guitar and all of a sudden she says, well, there's my manager over there. And so she's kind of going like this and I come walking over and, you know, typically in the music business, in a situation like that, especially in Nashville, you know, of course, everybody, number one, wants uh, a rep from a record label to be there, you know, with some kind of opportunity and probably a close second is a publisher. And so sure enough, this was someone from a music publishing company and she introduced herself, said, you know, your client is really great. I'm really interested. You know, I want to talk more. Um, so the story ends that as we were driving home, she said, do you know why I ended up deciding to do the show after all when I came back from the ladies room and told you that I would? And I said, no. And she said, because you always tell me that you never know who's going to be in the crowd 
she said, and that just really stuck in my head. And I thought, well, here we are in Nashville. And she said, I just felt in my gut, like, I bet you someone's going to be here. And she said, you know, that lady, that publisher ended up being that person. She said, so I'm glad that you always push me and you always tell me that, you know, you never know who might be in the crowd because somebody was tonight. You were very positive, very patient, very persistent, and truly showed you cared and you believed in her. And so you set the stage for this to work. Bruce. Yeah. Well, you know, there was uh, a guy that um, a, a recording studio here, he always used to compliment me and say, I really love that you aren't afraid to put your clients. Johnny, when I say in uncomfortable positions, I mean, in such a way that, you know, it's not uh, negative, you're kind of willing to put your clients in uncomfortable situations, meaning something that's going to kind of help them grow and push them further along and get them out of their comfort zone. So you don't coddle them and just kind of wash, rinse, repeat. And so the same client, uh, I got her book to perform at the House of Blues inside the Mandalay Bay on the really? Las Vegas Strip. And boy, oh boy, I can't even begin to try to tell you how nervous she was uh, for that show. But lo and behold, she pulled it off. And I said, you know, it's great experience. And now it's going to be more helpful to us when we promote you and people here that you played in Nashville, that you played on the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, we did another uh, short little trip one time where we spent a couple nights in Oklahoma City. And during the daytime, I got her booked onto, you know, kind of a morning magazine show where she was able to perform one of her original songs, sit down and do an interview, and then go back and perform another song. That night, I had her booked to perform at Toby Keith's. And then the next night, she performed at the Rodeo Opry, which was full. The, the audience was, was full and uh, they televised that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be able to say that you've done those kind of things, it makes my job easier as a publicist, but those are kind of those situations that he was referring to where he said, I really admire that you're not afraid to put your clients in uncomfortable positions because it gets her out there in front of bigger audiences into better venues mm -hmm. and, it just helps develop that confidence more and more along the way. That's, that, that's really something. That's really something. And I admire that, Bruce, and you. And it's like, it's like the late Franklin Delano Roosevelt used to say, you got nothing to fear but fear itself. So you can't let fear, fear immobilize you, that's, that's for sure. And you seem to be able to take control and do it such a way that you're soothing and you're calming and you're caring and, you're, and you, uh, you believe in your client and it shows. And uh, you're able to get them from being, I guess, real nervous and stressed and take that away and channel that in a positive way. And that, and hence, it turns out to be a, a very rewarding, positive, successful experience for your yeah. client and yourself. You had Kristen Schalk on your show. And as she was really kind of developing into a voice talent, she had always been a dancer first and she had a decent singing voice. But once she moved out to Los Angeles, I put her together with a private vocal coach who really she made tremendous strides working with him and so i said okay now it's time to actually go out and perform somewhere because you can sing in your apartment all day long you can go and work with him on private voice lessons all day long but until you actually start getting out in front of people and singing in front of an audience what's the point of it all so i flew out there and I said, we're going to go to some open mics just to get you into this whole realm of being in an environment where you're on stage singing in front of people. You're great in terms of dancing in front of people. You've been doing that for years and years. And it was one of those mixed emotion things where Kristen was excited about this new foray, but at the same time, she was nervous. And so we went to a place where every place is different in terms of what their open mic format is and this particular place says you get to do two songs you know although you can't go longer than 10 minutes and so she told me i'm only going to do one song and i said no you can do two here she said no i know that but i'm only going to do one and i said well why is that she said i i just i just i'm going to feel better only doing one and i said well i said i really want you to do two and she kind of was very uneasy about it and similar story, you know, went to the ladies room and I intercepted her on the way back. And I said, listen, you're going to do two songs. I said, because I didn't come all the way out here and us put this whole night aside for you to come here and do one song. 
I said, so you got to trust me on this. I said, I really need you to do two. And she said, okay, you know, well, which song should I do? So we worked it out. She went up on stage and did the first one and then hit that second song. And I could just see this tremendous change in her during the second song. And so when she came off stage, she thanked me and said, I'm so glad that you pushed me to do two songs. She said, because that first one, I was nervous and I was just kind of feeling my way through it. And I felt a lot better by the second song. And I said, I know you do. I know you did. And I knew you would. That's why I pushed you to do two songs, because I knew that that's how it was going to go. And so, you know, that's kind of one of those growth and development things where, you know, I do have to build that trust, as we talked about before, so that they say, okay, Bruce has been doing this a while. He obviously has a reason. He's not just pushing me to nag me. And then you get those results. That's great. Now you're talking about the songs were these original songs that they she was singing these songs original songs is that what you're no yeah, this was be, this was okay, cover okay. songs okay. Uh, she hadn't started writing yet um, but it was a case of songs that she knew by heart and you know didn't need the lyrics for uh, and was very confident in performing it was just a whole lot different of singing it out in public somewhere as opposed to singing it in your car or your apartment. That's true. That's true. Well, you certainly motivated and inspired her. That's for sure. And by the way, who were the, you know, you had said you had somebody that, I guess, that motivated you. Who was the person that motivated and inspired you? Is any one person or several people that has that motivated and inspired you, Bruce? Well, there's probably a few, but uh, the gentleman that I referred to before, uh, when I said about, you know, that he was always very insistent upon you need to be seen, you need to be in person at different events. Uh, I had actually worked in the Olympic movement, um, and he was the president of our federation. We were the world governing body for the sport of softball. And so women's softball, women's fast pitch softball was in the Olympics. And so I was the director of communications. So I was at the 2004 Summer Olympics in Athens. I was at the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, and I was the chief press officer for the women's Olympic softball competition. And we had 125 countries under our world governing body. Mm -hmm. And so he was the one that was kind of the, the public face of the federation of the world governing body that he would travel all around the world. And a lot of people, a lot of people would tell you that he was single-handedly responsible for women's softball ever having become an Olympic sport in the first place. So I thought, well, this guy's been at it a long time. I think I could probably learn a few things from him. And like I said, that that lesson that I mentioned uh, was was one great example. What was this man's name that you're talking about? You? His name was Don Porter. Don Porter, huh? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, unfortunately, he passed away uh, about a year and a half ago. He was 90 years old, oh. um, but he uh, he lived he lived a long softball life. That's for sure. It sounds like it. it sounds like he had quite a life. Yeah. Uh, now, what about, okay, do you have any, uh, you probably, you sound like you travel all over. You can tell me some of your traveling experiences as, as an entertainer and publicist and some of your your favorite venues that you've uh, had. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, it's kind of two different lives because when I was working in the Olympic movement, I went to 17 countries in 10 and a half years, some of them more than once. And then with now hear this, it's really kind of been, whether it's going to where clients are or whether it's going to where events are or whether it's going to where opportunities are. Uh, and I remember kind of getting my toe in the water in Nashville and, and starting to kind of feel my way around there and thinking, oh gosh, you know, someday maybe I'll even get out to Los Angeles. And, and to me, LA was kind of this you know, this kind of Goliath that it's like, oh gosh, you know, don't even think about going out there, you know, unless you really have some good reason. And now it's to the point where I'm very comfortable going to Los Angeles. And uh, just recently I had a, a client that I booked at the Hotel Cafe. And, you know, the Hotel Cafe is kind of one of those venues that people will talk about that they'll say, you know, they've performed at this place, at this place, at this place, and they'll rattle off a bunch of places that people in the music business will know that like, oh, wow, you actually played at, and one of them is the Hotel Cafe. So, you know, I've gotten to see a lot of cool places. Uh, I went to Nashville, and because I have a weekly podcast where I interview guests who are having success in entertainment, primarily music, I had interviewed Roy Orbison Jr. at one point on my podcast. And 
you know, that's part of Johnny, how you and I were talking about networking and building relationships. And so I really pride myself on trying to build relationships with those people who are guests on my podcast. And it, I'll admit, it gets a little challenging because I've been doing that show for seven and a half years now, uh, every week. So I'm up to 397 episodes. So it's kind of tough, you know, to, to really make a strong connection with every single guest. Mm -hmm. And the numbers eventually will bear it out where there's some people that you just don't really have a, a great connection with. But at the same time, I really do try to connect with those people. And Roy Orbison Jr. was just so kind and he was very genuine and we made a nice connection. Now, at the same time, it doesn't hurt that just like you, my shows are very long. So my podcast episodes are 45, 50, 55, 60 minutes long. So you're having a substantial enough conversation with that person that you can make some kind of a connection. If it's a five minute radio interview, you're right. not gonna really connect with that host. And so my point being that when I finished interviewing Roy Jr., we were, you know, quote unquote off the air. And he said, hey, Bruce, you know, that was great. Keep in touch. You know, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, if, if you ever get to Nashville, I'd love to meet you in person. I said, yeah, likewise, Roy, I do get there from time to time. So I'd love to meet you. And it was so great to me that he was sincere because he said, well, here, take my number down. This is my cell phone. And when you come to town, you know, call me and let me know and we'll set something up. And so sure enough, uh, the next time that I went to Nashville after that interview, I let him know in advance and he said, sure, come on over to the house and, and let's have lunch and I'll show you the studio that I have here where I do all my recording, uh, you know, and, and kind of show you some of dad's stuff and things like that. So that was that was a lot of fun. That that was really nice. Yeah, I, I've listened to some of your podcasts. Uh, uh, recently, let's see, there was Chad, there was Chad Wilson recently, and yeah. then there was there was some kind of thing with uh, music. Music followers was another one, and then you had another one. Let's see, you did have um, she's the, the the daughter of uh, Sissy Spacek. Um, yeah, yeah, Skylar Fisk. Skylar Fisk, and then the, and then there was also. Um, and Audra McLaughlin, there were about four yeah. different. You have so many, though. Very yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. Tell me about some of those uh, podcasts and also some of your ones that stand out. And that's an account. What an accomplishment that is. 397. Yeah. You've been at this for, it sounds like seven years, at least six and a half, seven years or so. Yeah, seven and a half years. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned Audra McLaughlin because that's a really nice example of, you know, she's someone that I had had on before. And because we felt comfortable with each other, she would send me a message from time to time and she would say, you know, hi, friend. And I thought, well, that's nice, you know, that she feels that, that we have that kind of rapport. And so she had a new release coming out and said, I'd love to come back on the show. And, you know, as you know, you know, you have to kind of look at your schedule and say, you know, who do I have coming up and how long has it been since this person has been on before? I don't want to have somebody back too soon. And so what we did was we agreed that we would do another interview. And then I saw on my calendar that I was going to be coming to Nashville and that's where she's based. So I said, well, the first time that we did our interview together, we just did it over Skype. And because these are audio only interviews, I don't even see the person. We just do it on Skype audio. We don't even turn our cameras on. Mm. So I said, you know, it'd be great to meet you in person finally and to sit down and do this next interview together while I'm in Nashville. And Lady Luck really smiled upon us because not only did we get to do that interview, but as we were done and saying goodbye, she said, how long are you in town for? And when I told her, she said, well, I'm performing tomorrow night. If you don't have plans, come and see me. So I even got to go and see her perform, which is great. She's a sweetheart. She has a great voice. She was actually on The Voice at one point in time. Uh, cool. And that's, you know, that's kind of, I was about to say a good example of the type of guests that I have. You said, you know, who are some of the people that have been on, um, you know, besides Roy Orbison Jr., I've had the keyboard player for Aerosmith. I had the lead guitar player for Garth Brooks. I had the drummer for Cheap Trick. I had the bass player for Pink, uh, the trumpet player for Billy Joel. And then I've had, at this point, four Grammy Award winners, a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, a Las Vegas headliner, three Emmy Award winners. And then, you know, like Audra, I've had people who have been on American Idol, The Voice, America's Got Talent, The X Factor, in fact, one of the girls who I interviewed that had been on The Voice, she actually won The Voice. 
So it's really been quite a, I don't want to so much say diverse guest list. Those names that I just mentioned, a lot of people will, oh, wow, oh, I, oh, that one sounds, you know, but then if I tell you about somebody like Chad Wilson, you're going to say, well, I'm not sure I know Chad Wilson. What has he done? And then I say, well, listen, I described my show as people that are having success in entertainment, primarily music. And it comes down, Johnny, to a conversation of, well, what do you consider to be success? And so everyone's definition is different. But when you look at a guy like Chad Wilson, for example, who people aren't going to identify with as quickly as they did all those others I just rattled off, then I'm going to tell you all of Chad's credentials. And you're going to say, wow, there's a guy that's having success in entertainment because he had a number one song in Belgium. He has a new song that just came out yesterday and he's in Denmark performing right now. And his list of accomplishments goes on and on and on to where you say, wow, how don't I know about this guy? I think it was four days before we did the interview. He had just opened up for Martina McBride. And oh. he has he's up this weekend for three awards in the Josie Awards. So mm -hmm. like I say, you might not necessarily have heard these people's names and you know be top of mind with it. But all of a sudden you read about what they've done and you say, wow, this is someone that I'd like to know more about. And so then I say, well, great. Then listen to the interview that I did with them on my podcast. That's great. That's great. And then, of course, the other one, the Skylar, there was Skylar Bisk, of course, the, uh, the daughter of Sissy Sis Sis Spacek. Tell me, the singer, songwriter, guitarist, tell me a little bit you know, more about her again. There was that yeah. one. And, and, of course, there was the music founders, too. That was another one. Yeah, yeah someone alive. like Skylar Fisk is interesting to me because when you do a show week after week, month after month, year after year for seven and a half years, you don't want to just wash, rinse, repeat and have a singer, songwriter, guitar player, a singer, songwriter, guitar player, a singer, songwriter, guitar player. People are going to say, gee, I wish this Bruce guy would mix it up a little bit. So you get someone like Skylar Fisk who were tempted to say, is Sissy SpaceX daughter, which of course she is, but she's kind of in a position where it's like, well, don't think of me as Sissy SpaceX daughter. I love my mom and I am the daughter of the award-winning actress, but guess what? I do music. And so we spent the overwhelming majority of that episode talking all about her music. She has a new album coming out. And then yes, in the second half of the interview, we did talk a little bit about her acting career because she is very much an actress and it was kind of neat. As much as I didn't want to spend a lot of time harping on her being Sissy SpaceX daughter, it was just great timing insofar as she is working on a movie right now that she's in, her mom is in, Dustin Hoffman is in, and Dustin Hoffman's son is in. So wow. that's really kind of unique when you get to talk to someone and you say, well, your mom is Sissy SpaceX, and not only are you in a movie with her, but Dustin Hoffman is in it with his real life son. So that's kind of neat where you say, okay, as the host of the show, I want to talk a lot about, about her music because that's what she wants to talk about. But I got to bring this up just because that's very unique. How many times in her acting career is she going to get to be in a movie with her mother? Not a lot. Wow. That's something. That's really it. She's in a movie with her mom. And she's with Dustin Hoffman. She's an actress and, a, and involved in music. Uh, very interesting. Very, very. Yeah, and the folks that you mentioned, um, you know, who run uh, an organization called Keep Music Alive, um, right. That's a story of where I was in Nashville in July, and I met those folks there, and they were kind of asking me all about Now Hear This Entertainment. And for those watching, I don't know that we've directly said, but Now Hear This Entertainment is the name of my podcast. So they were saying, what is Now Hear This Entertainment? Because this is who we are, and this is what we're doing. And it was kind of one of those timing things where you say, okay, great. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Please give me a business card. I'm not blowing you off. I'm just somebody that really likes to kind of dive in first and look up everything and do a lot of reading before I commit to something. And so sure enough, when I came back, I sat at my desk, I got on the internet, I looked at the website for Keep Music Alive, and I started seeing everything that they do. I mean, they have founded Kids Music Day. They have founded Teach Music Week. They have a book series. And I thought these people are really doing a lot with music, kind of in a promotional sense. 
Uh, and so it was a fascinating story to me. So I thought, yes, I want to have the two of you on Now Hear This Entertainment so that you can tell everybody all about this because they're nonprofit. You know, so this was just kind of in service to the music community. And I thought people can get involved in different ways wherever they are in the world. Uh, I have actually gotten listeners to Now Hear This Entertainment from 155 countries around the world. So I thought there could be somebody listening in the Netherlands who says, okay, I think I wanna participate in Teach Music Week next March. And by having those folks on the show, they're able to kind of tell people, here's what you can do to get involved. And then obviously it's a case of, you know, if you have more questions, you follow up, just like I'm always promoting the guest and saying, you know, please support these guests, download their music, don't just stream it from Spotify because they're going to get a fraction of a penny. Uh, so in the case of someone like that, it's go visit their website, see more about what they're doing, contact them and ask them questions of what you can do to promote uh, some of the activities that they have going on and participate in them. Very interesting. Very thorough you are, Bruce. Oh yeah. You come across on your podcast when I listen uh, very friendly and very knowledgeable and uh, conversational, and you're a great listener, and you do your preparation really well uh, in you know learning about uh, these all of these uh, topics and the people that I guess that you're uh, that you're talking to. So. Yeah, and where that comes from is you know when I launched the podcast. Now keep in mind this is February of 2014, so podcasting was not what it is today. Back right. then, Johnny. I thought that this was, oh, this will be a good way to promote my business. And maybe some guy who's listening in Minneapolis, Minnesota, will hear my show and say, gee, this Bruce guy sounds like he knows his stuff. I should see if he could manage and promote me from across the miles. Wow. And then podcasting turned into what it is now, and it's become so much more. But my point is that originally when I started to put the show together, I thought, well, wait a minute, as a publicist, I would love it if somebody would do a show where they would interview my client for 45 or 50 minutes instead of just for five minutes. And I wish that they would do research and really kind of do a deep dive and ask them a lot about what they're doing instead of just the same predictable handful of questions and just promote their latest single or promote their upcoming tour or talk about their new music video, which, you know, full disclosure, I of course do that. But I also recognize that, and this is because of the roots of where the company was built, right? Thinking back to how I said before about maybe that boy or that girl who is, say, a senior in high school, they're looking at some of these people that are having success in entertainment, and they're saying, boy, I wonder how they did that. I wonder how they got their song placed in film and TV, or I wonder how they got their newest album entirely crowdfunded through a Kickstarter campaign, or I wonder how they did get to perform at a place like the Hotel Cafe or at a place like the House of Blues. And so a lot of the questions that I ask on my show will be exactly that. And sometimes I'll come right out and say, there are listeners who are aspiring performers and they want to know, how did you get your song placed on that TV show? And because Johnny, they're so used to being asked a lot of these questions over and over, they'll kind of mail it in and the answer is on autopilot and they'll say, oh yeah, that was really great. I was really happy. It was, it was a proud moment in my career. And I'll jump in and say, I'm sure it was, but how did you get it? Did you have somebody helping you? Do you have an agent? Do you know someone who works on the show? Did oh. the music supervisor? And then all of a sudden you can tell the light bulb is going on and they're saying, okay, this Bruce guy actually wants to know the mechanics like, what were the logistics of me getting my song placed into this film or this TV show? And so then they kind of walk you through the process and it becomes kind of a, you know, people will listen to now hear this entertainment just for the entertainment value or they'll listen because they know and are interested in that guest or they're listening because they want to learn about the business and pick up some of these tips and some of these kind of how to type things from the guests. Well, you're teaching them uh, how to have fun and learn at the same time. That's, that's great. And you find it's very entertaining uh, the way you come across with your positive aura and the research that you've done. And you just you uplift uh, people. And, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't have to I don't list all those all those podcasts. But the ones that I did that I did listen to, I was uh, very inspired by it. I found it entertaining and very interesting. That's Thank for you. Sure, Bruce. Thank uh, you. For me. 
Yeah, how, you know, that's a clever name. Now hear this. How did that come? Did you create that name or was it somebody else who came up with that name? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a little known fact that when you see the logo for now hear this, which is here on my shirt and up on the panel behind me, I'm very much in my personal life, I'm very much a fan of the old time comedies. So the Marx Brothers, Evan and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, the Three really? Stooges, the Little Rascals. I was always a real big fan of them. So, you know, to see this guy who looks kind of from days gone by, and you would think that back in those days, right, that was kind of, you know, a form of promotion. Now hear this, now hear this, you know, where you'd see someone with a megaphone or they'd be standing on a street corner. And so my idea when I got the idea for calling the company Now Hear This was kind of twofold. It was Now Hear This, meaning I have something to say, but it's about somebody, because keep in mind, I was working primarily just with music people at this time. Like now I want you to hear their voice. So now hear this person that I'm ta that I'm talking about. So the first now hear this was, you know, me being that that old time barker that was trying to get people's attention. And then once I have your attention, it's now hear this person sing because they're terrific. Wow, I like that. Oh, just like as an analogy, something similar in a you know, in newspapers, the old saying, remember, um, extra, extra, read all about it. That's right. So that gets That's people's right. attention. So this, this gets people's attention. Now hear this. Yeah. And, and you know, pay attention. Yeah. what amazes me is when it came time for me to launch the podcast, I just assumed that I would also call the podcast now hear this. And because I am so immersed in the podcast community, I will go out and I speak at podcasting events around the country. And I will tell people who are brand new that are just starting a podcast. What I'm about to tell you is not rocket science. It's really more common sense, but you need to hear it anyways, because I'm surprised at how many people don't, which is they get what they think is this terrific idea for the name of their podcast, and they just go with it. And so I tell them, learn from my lesson. What I did was in 2014, I thought, well, I'm going to launch this podcast. I guess I'll just call it the same thing as my business. I guess that's good branding. And I did this thing, Johnny, called Look It Up. <laughs> I went on Google, I went on iTunes, and I punched in now hear this and I thought someone's already using it. And I think it was uh the it's it's like ABC like we're used to in the United States for television, but this was the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and they were already doing a podcast called Now Hear This. So I thought, well, I'm going to be interviewing people who are having success in entertainment, you know, primarily music, so maybe I'll just call it Now Hear This Entertainment. So I popped that into iTunes, I popped that into Google, and nobody was using it. And I thought, well, I guess that's the name of the show. It really wasn't anything magical, but it surprises me when people are so locked into an idea that they just go with it, and all of a sudden you find out, oh, someone's already doing that. Well, you came up with, you were thinking creative, and uh, I guess, and innovative, and uh, imaginative, and I guess you just you did research and you found out that, no, nobody was doing now this here, this entertainment. So you said, yeah. why not? I may as well. I may as well be the trailblazer on this, and that's what you yeah, did. There's, there's another neat little trick that I came up with, which is, I wanted to have something memorable but short that I could say on the air, that I could say on the podcast all the time, so people would remember it. Because if you think of what people might be doing when they're listening to a podcast, they're probably not in a position to be writing something down, and so. What I did was I thought, okay, since the podcast is called Now Hear This Entertainment and the logo for it shows the acronym NHTE, I thought, well, hmm, what if I just buy the domain name NHTE.net and then oh. I point that to the specific page on my website where the podcasts are and then that way I don't have to give out the company website address and, you know, slash podcast at the end or something like that, or start confusing people. Well, what website is he sending me to? Is that for his company or is it for the podcast? And I'm very old fashioned when it comes to, I really believe in driving web traffic. And I'm amazed when I look at potential clients or just people in the entertainment business period, and they don't have a website or they have a website and it's terrible or it's very outdated. So I'm such a strong believer in driving web traffic that I thought I'm going to buy the domain name nhte.net 
and have it land right on the podcast page of my website. That way it'll be very memorable. People will hear me saying it on the show week after week. It'll get stuck in their head. And anytime I need to send them there for something, I will say, just go to nhte.net and et cetera, et cetera. Click on this, click on that, whatever it is. And so that kind of gets to be habit forming. And it's something that's really worked for me. It's something I can put on a business card. I have it on the back of a lot of the shirts that I wear to promote my podcast. And it's just this little promotional trick, you know, that people use out there that I think kind of gets lost because you look for these quote unquote vanity URLs, you know, where you can personalize a website address and you can look and see if it's available. And if it is, there's several that I own that some of them I don't really use all that much, but I don't want to let it go. You know, if it costs you 25 bucks a year to renew it just so that you own that domain name, you're going to find that it comes in handy because if you're a guest on a show and somebody says, well, listen, we're running out of time. Uh, where can people go? You want to have something that people can remember that's going to be very easy for them to look up later on. So with something like mine, I thought I'm going to say nhte.net and people are going to remember that. And I've stuck with it for seven and a half years now. And I think that's a large part of it is that consistency. Yes, putting out a new episode every week, but always, always, always sending people to the website because you control everything there. So if you're an actor, if you're a singer, if you're an author and you have something to promote, yes, if you're an author, you want people to go buy your book probably from Amazon, but why not send them to your website first and then as they're reading about you and seeing everything else you're doing, of course you have buttons here and there or logos here and there for Amazon that sends them over to Amazon. And, you know, little tip, by the way, is for that to open in a new browser window so that your website is still open even when they're done and they close it. But, you know, that's a really good habit to get into is to make sure that your website's up to date. It has an easy address for people to remember and that you do have some of those buttons on there. So it's very easy for people to go buy your music or to go see the films that you, that you're working on or to go buy your book or whatever the case is. Well, that's what you call great promotion and you're, uh, you're cross promoting you're multi promoting promoting all over. So that's that, that accomplishes the goal that, that works for you, Bruce. And that's yeah. the winner. That yep. it is. Now you do other things. Now I know you, okay. You've done some speaking. Uh, to tell me about your, some of your speaking experiences, some of the places you've been to, and what are your topics on, and favorite venues on the speaking? Yeah, so actually, uh, there's an email waiting for me to reply to right now that came in today from somebody who runs uh, probably the biggest songwriters festival that I know. I think they get at least 200 songwriters that go to it, and it's 11 days long. This wow. takes place right on the Alabama and Florida border. So there's literally some performances are taking place in Alabama and some are taking place in Florida just because it's right on the border. And so they have asked me, will you come and do a presentation for us and speak to the songwriters who attend your workshop about promoting your music career? Because I do see I am in the position not only as a publicist, but as the podcast host to see some of the things that they're doing where I know that they can improve. And of course, this will get them more opportunities. So I'm going to go up there. That's going to be in mid-November and I'll be presenting. It's called the Frank Brown International Songwriters Festival. This is the 36th year that they're having this. So this one's been around for a really long time. It's a very prestigious songwriters festival to be a part of for me as a speaker. And even if you're selected as a songwriter to perform at it, it's really a feather in your cap because uh, there's a lot of big time songwriters that go to that. Where's that? Where's that at now again? No. That's right on the Alabama Florida border. Oh, okay. and it's it's held at a couple of different venues. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, I think I was really proud of January 2020. They held they hold every year in late January in Anaheim. They hold the NAM show, and NAM is the National Association of Music Merchants. And the Winter NAM show in Anaheim draws about 110,000 people over four days. And mind you, this is something that you have to be credentialed to get into that's not open to the general public. So that tells you how huge this is. People come from around the world, and it's only people who are credentialed, yet they still get 110,000 people at the Anaheim Convention Center over these four days. And they asked me to come and speak at that event because... A large part of the people who are there are 
merchants, manufacturers, people who you'll get the occasional artist who's there, but it's really people who are working in, say, the music. I don't want to say musical instruments, but musical instruments, recording equipment, uh, software, hardware. And they asked me, would you come and do a presentation and tell people why they should consider having a podcast, how it could help their business, how they could build their brand more by having a podcast. So, you know, if you would picture this massive, massive stage that I got to speak on and this huge crowd that was there, that was a real proud moment for me. And they said, since our event is four days long, we would like to also have you do another presentation a couple days later. And this one will be for artists. So we want to kind of, you know, have you do the presentation where it's the one that I'm going to do in November at the Frank Brown Festival, you know, of how they can promote themselves in their music career. And because I've been to the NAM show before, I know that when it gets to be Sunday, the last of the four days, a lot of people start kind of trickling out of town or they say, I'm exhausted. It's been a long three days and there's hundreds of that, or I shouldn't say hundreds of thousands, but there's thousands and thousands of people here. And so you don't get the best attendance. So I kind of went into it just telling myself, you know, hope that a lot of people show up, but plan that it might not really be that well attended. And my session was standing room only. The room was packed. This was, uh, they did kind of a co-op with the Hilton next door. So you can walk back and forth between the hotel and the convention center. And this meeting room that we were in, I think there was over a hundred people in there, like I said, standing room. And I was thrilled. And it really kind of gave me that adrenaline during my presentation. And it was really more kind of a congratulations and thank you that you're this motivated, you're this invested in your music career, that you're putting in the time to be here on a Sunday afternoon after you've been in in the NAMM show for three and a half days. I love seeing that you're that devoted to what you're doing, that you want to be here for my presentation. So that that was really special. That's that's great. That's really happy memories. How have you been able to overcome? I mean, I don't know if you were, were you always this confident, uh, Bruce, but uh, how were you able to overcome uh, any anxiety for getting up and speaking or, you know, I mean, have you always, or is there a time that you were, uh, that you were nervous and that somehow you were able to overcome it because you're really confident now of what you're doing? Yeah. I'm not sure that it's really nerves so much as I'm someone that has always been a talker from a very young age, a very young boy. You know, I would come home from school. I would tell my mom about what happened in school. I would push the chair over against the wall and I would climb up on the chair and reach up and get the phone off the wall. And I'd call my grandmother and tell her what I did in school that day. And as time went by, you know, I got to where by the time I got to college, I had myself convinced that I wanted to go into broadcasting. And although I ended up going the public relations route, I still did a lot of broadcasting anyways. And so I think kind of getting those reps along the way, Johnny, helps you build that confidence. You know, I was doing, uh, I was the sports director at the college radio station. Eventually I became the co-station manager at the college radio station. Then I got a couple actual radio jobs themselves. And so, you know, from a young age, meaning college student. So all of a sudden, you're just getting so many opportunities where I think when you couple that with, like I said before, with now hear this, you see the results that you're getting for people. And of course, you know, when it comes to speaking, you're going to be the one who kind of tells people, these are what my talks are about. So it's going to be something that you specialize in, something that you know about, something that you're comfortable talking about. So, you know, another one of my more memorable ones was I was asked to come up to Washington, D.C. to give the closing keynote at an event called DC PodFest. And that was really special because when you're the closing keynote, that's it. The conference is ending and everybody is going to remember the last speaker that they heard, which in this case was Bruce. And so I gave a very motivational talk of why what we do matters and that every time you turn on the microphone to record a podcast episode, you need to remember that. But again, it's speaking from experience about something that I know, something that I enjoy, something that I'm confident in doing. And I think that's kind of what helps translate when you're a speaker on stage or when you're being interviewed that it's like I always used to tell people, there's really this stigma with job interviews that people get really nervous when they're going for a job interview. And I would always say, well, why are you nervous? Because 
all they're going to do is ask you questions about you and who knows you better than you. So there's no reason to be nervous. Right. That's right. Well, that's great. So where was your training then as far as your training uh, in uh, schools that you went to on the way up and uh, public courses and I guess in public, did you get any bachelor's degree, master's degree or any PhDs or where, where were your trainings at and what you did? Yeah, so I had gotten a bachelor's degree in media communications uh, from a private college in Buffalo, New York called Madai College. And I think what really kind of gave me my, my real on-the-job training was when I was a college student, now back in those days, they required internships and something called a practicum. The internship, you were only supposed to do 150 hours, and the practicum was 450 hours. So I remember when it came time for my practicum, I spent an entire semester uh, assisting the marketing manager at an international company that manufactured and marketed athletic playing services. So that was great experience for me. But what really helped was for the internship, you had to only do 150 hours. Well, I ended up getting an internship with the National Hockey League team where I lived at the time, which was Buffalo. So, you know, when you're working for a hockey team, a National Hockey League team, they have games all season long. They're not going to say, well, you only needed to do 150 hours. So thanks. Good luck. It's look, if you're going to intern with us, we're telling you, you have to intern with us through the whole season. So I did that and I loved it. And they were so happy with me that I said, well, I do have to do a second internship. So can I come back next season and do another one? And they said, yeah, please, we love you. So I came back and did it again that next season. And then when I graduated, and it's funny because sometimes I'll go out and I'll speak to college classes and I'll say, I'm a bad example. And the kids will all look up and the students will say, what? I'm a bad example. The story I'm about to tell you does not typically happen this way. So don't go into an internship thinking they're going to offer you a job at the end, thinking that they owe you something because they don't. They just gave you all kinds of experience. But in my case, when I was done with the internship, they did offer me a full-time job there because it coincided with the timing of when I was going to be graduating. So, you know, I had a couple of great years there just as an intern where I was really a sponge and, you know, would sit with the director of public relations. His name was John Gertler. And John Gertler is someone who, to this day, I still remember and I still am grateful for opportunities to give a shout out to and, and keep his name out there because he was so instrumental in teaching me so much about public relations that I really learned a lot and was a lot more confident when it was time to be a full-time paid staff member because oh. of how much I had gained from those two years as an intern. You were fortunate that all this experience paid off. You ended up transition, transitioning then from as an intern into an actual job. Very much so. So it, it turned out to be like on the job training. That's that's phenomenal. They're really glad that that worked out. All's well that ends well there, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you were, you're, are you from Mass? Where are you from originally now exactly? Where were you born? Um, from Buffalo, New York. Oh, Buffalo, New York is where you're okay. yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So that's, that's, that's great. That's really something. I know that you also do, uh, you, know, you did some blog writing now for your publication. Now you're this entertainment. Uh, tell me about that, about what the blog writing is involved and uh, the topics. I'm sure it's probably about entertainment. Uh, you know, different subjects and things you're doing. Tell me all about that. Yeah. So as I had mentioned before, in February 2014, that's when I launched Now Hear This Entertainment, the podcast. And seven months later, in September of 2014, I had learned over those seven months that it really helps to have a consistent blog. And I decided, well, I guess consistent, does that mean every week also? And I think in hindsight, I kind of look back and say, boy, I wish I hadn't decided to do it every week because for some reason, I don't know, I've noticed there's a difference. There's lots and lots and lots of guests out there that I can interview for my podcast. But when it comes to coming up with ideas of what to write a blog about, I will admit that there are times when I really, I don't want to say get writer's block, when I'm really challenged to say, okay, what can I write about this time? But to answer your question about what am I writing about? And I still do this to this day. So every Monday on the website, and it's nowhearthis.net, H-E-A-R, nowhearthis.net, in the blog section, I post every Monday. And it's, yeah, it's typically 
advice, experiences, observations about the entertainment business, typically more towards music. Uh, occasionally, I'll have somebody write a guest blog for me, um, but it's really just kind of advice. It's things that people can learn from by reading it, you know, mistakes to avoid, uh, things that I've seen, please don't do this, you know, whoever's reading this in your career. And I think it challenges me to kind of be extra observant in these different environments that I'm in so that I can look at it and say, is this a teaching moment for someone that I can put into a blog? Because there might not be a place for it in a podcast interview, but if I can write about it in my blog, then I will. There are certain times during a podcast interview where a guest will say something that will turn the light bulb on in my head and I'll say, well, that's just like, and then I'll describe the scenario. Mm -hmm. But in the blog every week, I'm generally writing in such a way that it's going to help somebody to learn something that's going to help them in their entertainment career. That's great. So it sounds like your, your writing, writing comes from your experiences, I guess. Um, it sounds like. Very much so. And, um, and I was just going to mention about the writer's block. Have you ever you know, come, tried really hard and for some reason was not able to come up with any ideas? And if you did, how were you able to overcome that? Yeah, sometimes I will notice that I'm struggling to come up with something. Fortunately, I'll usually kind of notice this red flag far enough advance uh, where I will contact someone and say, can you write a guest blog for me? I do need it by this weekend because I have to publish it Monday morning. And I'm usually successful that I don't know that I've ever missed a Monday. I know that I've never missed a Wednesday in terms of putting out a new podcast episode for Now Here This Entertainment. And I really don't think that I've ever missed a Monday. In fact, early this year, I unfortunately had COVID really bad, really bad. I was in the hospital for six or seven days. And all I knew was I have to somehow put out a podcast episode and I have to write a blog. Uh, so I think in the blog case, I think I might have gotten somebody to write something for me. And the podcast, as I've said a few times, my episodes are usually 45, 50, 55 minutes long, sometimes 60 minutes. In the case of the podcast, I recorded something that was five minutes long. And I just told everybody, I'm not going to say the word you know what I'm sick with, you know why I've been in the hospital. Uh, okay. I don't even want to say it out loud, but you can hear it in my voice. I really feel terrible. I did have to put something out though, because I always tell you that I'm going to have a new episode for you every week. So that was a case of where, oh, you couldn't find a guest? No, that's not the case. I was just so shot and in the hospital and then I came home and, and it actually got worse before it got better. So I was probably, you know, for all intents and purposes, I was probably down for two months. Wow. Uh, and that was a case of where it's a little easier to sit and write a blog because you can kind of do this, you right. know, and really take your time and, and type it out. And there's no real pressure around you. No one's kind of over you or listening. And when you're doing a podcast, you know, you have to be on, you know, and you're recording and there's a guest that you're carrying on a conversation with. So those were very challenging, and I, I'm I'm really I'm really upset, you know, that I had to do some podcast interviews where I was not 100% health at all. But in my estimation, Johnny, I kind of have this attitude that I have a verbal contract with the listeners. As far as they know, Bruce is going to put out a new episode of Now Hear This Entertainment every Wednesday. That's it. So if I miss a Wednesday, I have broken my contract with them. And there's a term in the podcasting industry called pod fading and pod really? fading means that somebody kind of is starting to either lose their interest or they're starting to distance themselves from their own show. And so what I know from that is as soon as you make an excuse or I should, not an excuse, an exception, as soon as you make an exception one time to miss a show, it makes it easier to another time say, well, I did miss last month for this reason, or I did miss seven weeks ago for this reason. Well, now you've missed twice. And then all of a sudden life gets in the way and things happen. And before you know it, people just fade out altogether. And you say, how's your podcast going? And they say, I don't, I don't even do it anymore. Oh, you stopped? How come? And they kind of describe this path for you. So the nice thing about writing the blog is 
yes, there's a deadline, but it's a very different environment where you can do it Monday morning where you wake up Monday morning and say, I don't even know what I'm going to write about today. And you can take some time and think about it and come up with a topic. Whereas with the podcast, you better have a guest lined up and you better have a date set when you're going to record that interview because you know it has to be out by this particular date. So it's very different writing for the blog versus conducting podcast interviews and releasing new episodes. Very interesting, Bruce. Very interesting. Very enlightening and interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, anyway, uh, I am sorry that you had to go through such an experience with the COVID and, and the hospital and everything. And, but I am happy that you survived it and that you're healthy and you're doing well. That's for sure. Thank you. And uh, that's important. One thing you can have millions of dollars doesn't mean a thing if you don't have your health. If you're healthy or wealthy, hopefully you have both health and wealth, of course. That's right. That's right. A lot of people are so obsessed with money, they're not even thinking about their health. They're letting their health go down. See? Yeah. So but you're doing the right thing, that's for sure. And as long as you, you know, you uh, maintain yourself and keep yourself as healthy as you can um, and enjoy what you're doing, then you're fine. So there yep. you go. Every yeah. day that, you know, uh, all of us are above this earth is a blessing because, you know, you can be here today and gone tomorrow. And That's my right. philosophy is live each day as if you're last. You never know your last going to come about. Go for your dreams and take your vacations. That way you can say uh, you did it your way as full life as possible. Absolutely no regrets because we know there's no do-overs or encores. When it's over, it's final. That's for sure. Uh, can you tell me now, any, 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 talk to me about any opinions about uh, the talent shows out there like America's Got Talent, X Factor, The Voice. Um, you know, um, all these all these shows, um, American Idol. What are your what are your feelings and opinions? Do you really feel that they're of great help in and in having people uh, get recognized and their, for their talents and to be able to be discovered and successful? Do you think that they're real helpful? Yeah, I have a few thoughts on those. You know, back in the day when they were first getting started, I thought that there were too many novelty acts where they would intentionally have on somebody who was bad just for ratings. And they've gotten a lot better at getting away from that and finding that there truly is so, so much talent out there that they really deliver a terrific product when you tune in to watch because the people that they have really are good. I think what tends to happen, however, is some of the participants, and I've interviewed lots of them, they tell you what a great experience that is for them, what a boot camp it ends up being for them, learning all about the music industry. I think, unfortunately, they also kind of get, I don't want to say, I'll say stars in their eyes. And I think they put too much weight on, I was on The Voice, or I was on America's Got Talent. And just like anything else, it's a, what have you done for me lately business, where in the entertainment industry, if you're talking about having been on, say, The Voice or American Idol seven years ago, I don't want to say nobody cares, but nobody cares. It's like, okay, that's great that you did that seven years ago, but what have you been doing the last seven days or the last seven weeks? So I think people kind of get a little too caught up in still carrying that banner as having been on those shows at some point, because it's a great opportunity to springboard yourself to other whatever it is, other performances, other contacts, other recordings that you can do, other collaborations. And so I think the participants, the competitors, the contestants, the cast members, if you will, need to kind of take the blinders off and realize, hey, this can open me up to a whole lot, win, lose, or draw. Now, obviously, you don't want to be knocked out the very first show. The longer that you hang around, the more that your name gets recognized, the more that you build up your social media followers, the more that you build up your actual following, your actual fan base of people who are actually going to buy your music. People are going to buy tickets to come and see you perform. So I think that's kind of someplace that these participants really need to look at a lot more closer. And while it's terrific to win, we all have heard those conversations before where people will say, name me five people who have won The Voice. Name me five people who have won American Idol. So even the people who actually win it aren't always household names anymore. So it's kind of what you do with that after the fact where I think a lot of the value is not the value, but a lot of the value. Because as I said before, there is tremendous value in taking advantage of being on the show and learning about being on a TV show, learning about 
the music business, learning about your actual performance and utilizing those coaches that they have off stage that you don't see on the show and actually becoming a better entertainer. So there's a lot of pros to, to those at the same time. Uh, you know, some of the cons are, are worth noting. Um, but I say if someone's got the opportunity, especially if you're only, gosh, you know, 16 years old, absolutely seize those opportunities. I see. Okay. Well, it works for some people. And then others, I guess, are trying and they try to, they, they go out there and audition and I guess they're disillusioned and they don't, they don't quite get the call back. But that doesn't mean they don't have talent. It just means that whatever talent they had wasn't the right one that this, these uh, venues were, were looking for. So that's right. they have that's to think big. of some other ways. You know, it doesn't mean to give up, that's for sure. Because the old saying is, you know, quitters never win and winners never quit. Yeah. Yep. I came up with an original poem a long time ago, uh, which is uh, positive thoughts make you hot. Negative thoughts make you rot. So be hot, don't rot, or else you'll go to pot and you'll lose a lot and you won't be a big shot. I like that. I like that. I wrote that a long time. Yeah, that's true. Kind of like what the mind can believe the mind can achieve. My father may rest the beast, would have been a positive image seminar speaker, but and he was a fan of Bob Proctor, but unfortunately, he ended up getting his, demo, his dimension stroke and they passed, unfortunately. Mm. But uh, he did have some he did have some great talents that he did. He'll never be forgotten. Uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to ask you now, uh, if, you had, if you had to do anything over again in your career, uh, would you do anything differently? I'm laughing because we just finished talking about, you know, being happy and healthy and that money isn't always everything. But. I think in the beginning, I was so eager to get the company started that I was leading too much with my heart and kind of leaving, I don't want to say leaving the, the financial aspect out of it, but I think I would have started charging people faster and higher amounts when I first started instead of, you know, just being so gung-ho about getting the business off the ground. Uh, there's definitely a lesson to be learned about not doing things for free about that it's okay to say no to people and i think that's something that i would do differently uh, if i had to do it all over again at the same time i certainly learned an awful lot from those early years and i certainly was able to build momentum whether those were the right decisions to make at the time or not and so i'm still thankful for the experiences that i had at the same time, it did kind of help me to see that, okay, you need to make a shift in your business in terms of some of these different things, which I did correct at, at different points in time. Um, but, you know, I think everything happens for a reason. And so you can ask that question to every guest on the amazing original Johnny Blaze show, and they're going to tell you, I probably should have done this different. But I believe that everything happens for a reason. So the reason that it played out the way they did, even if they would go back and change it, it was meant to be that way from the out, from the outset. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense, Bruce. And everybody's life is different, that's for sure. Similar but different. No two people are alike. Uh, and it, you know, when you did your blog on the blog writing, I noticed you had something on there. Uh, was it three or four reasons why the people would pitch you and it would end up coming back no? for some reason, what were your, your reasons on that? Why would you say no? There's, there's reasons for, uh, you know, it's always a reason for everything. Oh yeah, so you're referring to people who actually wrote to me and they were trying to pitch themselves to me and I wrote back and said it was a no. And right. I'll tell you, there's probably more than three, but you know, when people write to me and they just say to whom it may concern, or they'll start it off with, hey, you know, as though we're friendly with each other, uh, or they'll put dear, comma, where you can tell that they meant to insert a name there and they forgot to. Sometimes you can tell they're pulling automatically from some sort of list because they'll try to say, dear, now hear this, and it'll say, dear, now. And I think, okay, well, this person is just automating this. So that's a no. I'm not even going to write them back. Um, you know, people who write because they want their song or their music exposed through now here this entertainment, okay, so we're talking about the podcast and not the company, they will say, could you play my song? Or they'll say, I would love it if you would air my music on your station. And I think, well, that's a no, I'm not even gonna write this person back because number one, this is not a radio station. So you didn't do your research. You're just sending this out to anybody and everybody. And number two is, 
if you would look a little closer, you would see that there's a chance to get a long interview out of me. And instead, all you did is write and say, could you play my song? And so this list goes on and on. The mistakes that I see people make in these emails where I think it's going to be a no. And nine times out of 10, the no is I'm not even going to write you back. And I know from the publicist side what that's like to write to someone and not get a response and wonder, are they genuinely not interested or did they not even read my email? And so in my case, I'm the one now that's looking at something and saying, I read it, I'm just not even gonna write you back. And then that's where you can tell if they're serious and if they are blasting out to a list or if they're specifically writing just to Bruce. If they write back and say, Bruce, I wrote you this last week, I'm just following up, I'm very interested. And if they say, being on the Now Hear This Entertainment podcast, some of them, I can tell they'll cheat. They'll say, I really loved your latest episode. It was really well done and I learned a lot. Well, that sounds really vague. You didn't even say who the guest was. You didn't say why you liked it. You didn't say what you learned. So I can kind of see through that thing and I just will ignore those and move on because there's lots of other work that I have to do. There's lots of other emails that I have to answer. And if that person was really serious and they were really trying to get to me, they'll find a way to contact me back and they'll let me know. I generally, genuinely, excuse me, am interested in your show and this is why. So they're really not doing their homework. They're not preparing. They're not showing that they're genuinely interested. They're not taking the extra steps that are necessary to show that they're really sincere. So uh, exactly. I, don't, I, can, I can't blame you then. You feel like it's a waste of time. So exactly. There you go. Um, anyway, so getting back to this now, uh, I want to ask you if there's any, do you have any uh, present projects or future projects, uh, dream projects at all? Actually, I very recently launched a online course. It's called Media Interview Tips Course, and it's at interviewtipscourse.com. And what I'm teaching in that course is once you get booked for an interview, that's only half the work. Now you have to actually get prepared to do the interview so that when it comes off, whether it's TV, radio, a YouTube show, a podcast, whatever it is, you get some results from that interview. You don't come away from it saying, well, that was a waste of time. I didn't get anything from that. Because I think what a lot of people tend to do, especially in this day and age when so many people are doing so many things from home, obviously what happened in the world over the last year and a half shifted a lot of people over to working from home now. And I think people see that it's real easy to just sit at home and get on the phone or get on Zoom or get on Skype or get on whatever and be interviewed. And so they kind of take that, I'm at home, I can relax and they just kind of mail it in and they're missing out on opportunities. And of course, as someone who is a publicist, as someone who worked in pro sports for so many years, and as someone who also has done 397 podcast episodes, I have so much experience that I wanna share with people so that I can teach them in this course this is what you need to do. I think there's something like 25 or more tips. Uh, I think it's closer to 30 tips of preparing for these interviews. I also have a module in the course that actually gives at least 15 different sources so that if people are looking to see, well, where can I find more interview opportunities? I cover that as well. So this course is really designed for indie musicians, for actors, for inventors, for small business owners. If you're somebody who gets interviewed, if you're someone who thinks they should be interviewed, if you are someone who gets interviewed and thinks you should be interviewed more, that's who I designed this course for so that people don't just sit at home and get themselves booked and then say, okay, it's coming up on this day at this time and I got this and they don't touch it again until the actual time of the interview this way, they come away from it saying, great, I'm an author. I can tell that I sold more books as a result of that interview. Or I'm a musician. I saw more downloads of my music. Or I'm an actor. I saw more views on my demo reel or my YouTube channel or whatever it is. That way, people come away. Your business, your product, your service, whatever it is that you're trying to get results for, 
you took my class and you came away and you said, okay, now I'm going to be a lot more effective when I get interviewed. And I'm also going to get myself interviewed more because of the module where Bruce gave out ways that you can find more interview opportunities. I really love that, Bruce. That's great because you're touching all the different aspects of it and teaching people. Uh, it's not just getting the interview. It's being prepared, knowing what you're talking about your subject, getting into the person that you're talking to or you're being interviewed by. And you're putting your whole, uh, you're putting everything into it. It's not just going through the motions. Well, I think I salute you and congratulate you on that. And I will, pro and I proclaim you, since you have been doing this for what, what seven, seven and a half years, your podcast, and yeah. I've been at this for such a long time, 397 episodes, as the king of the podcast, podcasters. <laughs> Bruce, the, Bruce, the podcaster king, that's what I proclaim you as. <laughs> you, are the you are the trailblazer of this. And I'm sure there's other people that follow and they do their own thing, but you're, you're definitely unique and you, you know, you stand up for yourself and you do all the things that you feel are right, not just for yourself, but for others. Well, and, you know, and I think it's also a, a practice what you preach example, because with interviewtipscourse.com, I'm teaching people, but it also forces me to go back into my role as a publicist and say, okay, it's great to have this class out there, but until you tell people just because interviewtipscourse.com sits out there on the web, no one's going to know about it until you go out and promote it. So whether that's running Facebook ads, whether that's doing something through an email blast, whether that's being interviewed on shows like yours and telling people about it. It's like when I tell people, if you're just starting a podcast, you need to promote your podcast. You can't just say, well, it's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's on and you list off all the platforms. Well, guess what? There's thousands and thousands of podcasts out there. Just because you released it and it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Spotify, doesn't mean people are just going to automatically find it. You need to promote it. The other night, it was earlier this week, at the monthly Florida Podcasters Association meeting, they asked me to speak about 20 plus ways to promote your podcast. So I was teaching everybody that night, everyone who was in attendance, yes, of course you have to use social media. I would kind of say, duh if you're not posting on social media, but don't just think, I post about my podcast every time a new episode comes out on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Of course you do, you should, but if that's all you're doing, you're missing the boat. And so I went on to give them probably two dozen different ways that they could be promoting their podcast. That's, that's great, that's really something. That's covering everything and uh, doing it from your heart and mind, body, heart and soul. Uh, Bruce, I'm gonna ask you now, uh, and I've really, I've really enjoyed uh, this interview very much. Uh, how can people, um, if they want to find out more about you, Bruce, um, how is, tell me about the social media links and all the different areas where if anybody wants to find out more about you that, uh, that they can. Yeah, so the easiest way is if they go to nowhearthis.net, and again, that's H-E-A-R, and similarly for the podcast, nhte.net, that website has icons for Facebook, for Twitter, for LinkedIn, for Instagram. So there's obviously a contact button on the website to just send me an email. But if people are more interested in connecting through social media, whether it's actually following those accounts or messaging me through those accounts, then by all means, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, they're all on that site. And just click on the button for whichever one you want to go over to or as I said, on nowhearthis.net, on nhte.net for the podcast, you can just hit the contact section and write me an email as well. Well, you're all over the place, that's for sure. This, that sums it up, that gives the people a better idea if they wanna reach out to you to find out about you. I think that's very important. I always, I always like, don't want people to know how other people can reach out, that's important. Um, and you have to be everywhere these days, you have to be on all those different platforms because you know, I always tell people that you may prefer to use, say, Facebook, for example, but somebody's thing might be Twitter or someone's thing might be Instagram. And so you can't be all things to all people, meaning you can't be on all the different platforms that are out there. But at the same time, if you limit yourself to just one, you might be missing out on people just because they might say, I don't really use Facebook that much or I don't really use Twitter that much. So the more present you are on a lot of these different platforms, the better chance you have of somebody saying, oh, great, I'm really thrilled to see that you're on Instagram because that's my favorite and they follow you or they message you or both. And had you not been there, you might not have ever heard from them. That's true. The more, the more uh, places that you're at, the better uh, there's a chance that people uh, know you and they, and they reach out to you. 
Otherwise, you're just limiting yourself. You're right, and I agree. Yeah. You don't you don't want to be limited. You want to be unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, Bruce. Well, like I say, it, the time has really flown by. You have the great smile. You have the ambience, the positiveness, uh, the charisma, the chutzpah. Yeah, you know what you're doing and truly love what you're doing. And the world would be a better place, Bruce, if there were more people like yourself. So I'm thank truly you, my pleasure. I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being my guest on the amazing Richard Johnny Blaze show. Thank my guest, Bruce Borsniak. And uh, until, until next time, ladies and all my fans and friends, always keep a smile on your face and a song in your heart. So happy trails and blaze out. If you would like to be a guest on a Zoom entertainment talk show, please send us an email at amazingoriginaljbshow at gmail.com. And remember, all of our guests will receive a complimentary DVD of their appearance on the show. All of our shows appear on YouTube and Facebook. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every single show receives at least two, 3,000, sometimes 4,000 views per episode. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing, original Johnny Blaze has just left the building. Good night, and God bless. <laughs>